representation. Students should have a capability for change. Connectivity in the sense that they're able to not only provide for themselves, but for the for the people that you know elected them. It's a functional government where um, public needs are put first. Accountability. The power that they have is used only to serve. A government that guarantees the economic and social well-being of their people. Equity. Representation. Give a good education to the people. People should receive what they work for. Secularism. Somehow related to God. And should have a clear purpose and priorities. To do what is best for the people. A leader with a positive image. Transparency. Clarity. A democratic structure. An ideal leader. It's democracy. Provide a security of the people. Improve education. Everyone has access to basic rights. Zero corruption. Public health. Transparent with their citizens. Freedom of corruption. A functioning legislative branch. The access to information. Education. Rule of law. Equality. To set a good example. Like strictly enforced laws. So mix between taking care of what the people need and what the people want. Be democratic in participating with the decisions. An ideal government definitely exists in everyone's minds. But has anyone ever considered actually portraying it? It's not attainable. It's unrealistic. That's so childish. Are people's first reaction to the phrase, an ideal government. But if we take a step back and reflect on our understanding of the world, we may be able to answer some truly big questions. What would an ideal government look like to you? Let's start by looking at three essential elements of an ideal government. Democracy, corruption-free, and education were some of the most common responses from international students all over the world. Not everyone will agree with these three elements, but they do represent a certain population. Other elements such as transparency, clarity, law and order, security, and wealth were all mentioned and they may be equally important. However, the focus will be on the three most popular responses. Let's listen to the following interviews to learn more from everyone's perspectives and find out why these elements are valued. After hearing from the international students, we'll be listening to three experts as well for their take on the question. And hopefully, you'll be able to answer the question yourself. What do you think are the three most essential elements of an ideal government? We'll begin by looking at the most common element, or aspect, that was responded. Democracy. Let's hear what the respondents have to say. Um, so obviously democracy. This is a Sam Mina, a high school student born and raised in Amman, Jordan. Um, so obviously democracy, I feel like... In order for a government to function properly, um, the people that this government is, is, is supporting or protecting or are working for, essentially, need to have a say in who is representing them or who is helping them or providing them with the things that they need to, to survive. Because I don't think a... I, that's what I would personally prefer, and that's why I think a democracy is important. Now let's hear from a different perspective. So, um, my name is Matteo Markle. I was born in a small town in central Switzerland, and I've grown up there for the past 15 years. So for me, uh, the first most essential element would be the fact that a government needs to have a democratic structure. So um, that what that means to me is um, having freedom of expression, um, where the government represents the people as a whole. Um, and allows for the diversity of people, and that not only the government, but the leader itself, the supreme leader or the prime minister or the president, whatever system you're using, is a leader that's democratically elected, elected by the people, for the people, so to say. And so there's elections in that sense, um, and that people are the main interest of the government. So the health and well-being of the people is the most important thing. So for an ideal government, First, um, my, my first point was democracy. This is Indra Deshmukh. Let's hear her introduce herself. Okay, I'm Indra Deshmukh. I'm in 10th grade right now. Um, and I live in Munich in Germany, but I was born in the US and I lived there for seven or eight years. Um, and then after that, I moved to India where my family is from. So that's sort of my cultural background. So for an ideal government, First, um, my, my first point was democracy. 
um, so that every citizen gets a voice, they get a chance to change things in their own country because the citizens are the ones who really know best for their own country and who know what they need. So um, a democracy really helps to get that all into perspective. And if there is a leader as a sort of figure for the country, they can still listen to other people's ideas and problems and sort them out so that everyone has equality and everyone is happy. And lastly, this is George. He's originally from Germany, but he spent most of his life in Taiwan. I, I do find that there are a lot of um, advantages to a dictatorship, mm -hmm. but in the end, a, a democracy is the way to go because in the end, that's really what counts, what most people want. But I think a democratic system should live on not 50% being the majority, but something like 70%. Now we'll move on to the second most responded essential element of a government. No corruption. Let's hear what some of the respondents had to say. Let's start by hearing from Leila. So my name is Leila. I'm in ninth grade. I'm 14 years old. I go to Junecrest American School in Dubai. I'm Saudi and my dad's Saudi and my mom's from Syria. I grew up in Saudi Arabia and I moved to Dubai um, last year. The thing that I think is important is making sure that the representatives aren't corrupt and that they're not abusing their power as representatives of the government and that they have the citizens' best interests in mind and that everyone is given equal rights and opportunities and that no one is put above the law and everyone follows the law. Now let's hear from another voice. Okay, so my name is Isabella Gonzalez Castellanos. I am 15 years old. Uh, my siblings and I were born in here in Bogota, Colombia. I think the second thing will be uh, to eradicate corruption, like for this to not exist. Because for example, I don't know, if you pay a tax for using the road, like when you have a car, that money goes, that money should go where it has to go. Corruption prevents, for example, medicines from reaching to these big people or makes it impossible to build a new school. Uh, so most importantly, corruption, I think, breaks trust between citizens and the state. And I believe that trust is, an, is essential for developing like a, and to produce results, like to grow. And also that I believe that without corruption, uh, there will be transparency, honesty, and integrity, which is, I believe is important in a society. And this is something that like is not happening nowadays, well, at least here. Mm -hmm. Special Flannery, 15 years old. I grew up in Dubai for about seven, seven-ish years. And then I moved back to Australia with my family. But um, ethnically, I'm Malaysian, Chinese, Australian. Next up, we have Aislinn, who in fact talks about the importance of accountability in leaders. The idea of being accountable is not exactly the same as not being corrupt. However, she does make a link between the two concepts that is worth mentioning. Let's have a listen to what she has to say. Accountability. I have found that there has been a lot of cases of um, politicians being um, corrupt, I guess you could say. And in, in some cases, they're just not held accountable for their actions and kind of forgiven or not forgiven but nothing is done about it so accountability needs to be a real big thing where once like very high leaders like presidents prime ministers need to be held accountable for actions that they've done and regard like even if they say sorry they can still be held accountable and lastly, this is Valentina. So my name is Valentina Martinez. I am 15 years old. I was born in Bogota, Colombia. Both of my parents were also born here. I've lived here my whole life. I study at Gimnasio Femenino. Um, so first of all, I think obviously zero corruption because where there is corruption, there is theft. Therefore, uh, where there is theft, there is no growth. So the country can grow economically. 
And finally, we have education. It was the third most mentioned element. Let's find out why by listening to some of the responses. We'll start from Edgardo Paez, who is from Colombia. So firstly, my name is Edgardo Paez. I'm Colombian. I am 16 years old. Currently, I live here in Barranquilla. And um, I study at the British International School. And I also think that the government should improve education. Education is the key for the future. If the child, if the children are learning something that isn't right, how can that country slash government improve? Now let's hear from a different perspective. And so uh, my name is Josefina Saure. I'm 15 years old. I'm from Osorno, Chile. And I'm in the ninth year at the German School of Osorno. I think it's the um, a good government must give a good education to the people of its country so uh, that they have the necessary tools to make uh, their own opinions and defend uh, in different subjects and defending them with solid arguments. Uh, it is much easier to control a inorate um, population than uh, people with a voice. And lastly, we have Ana Maria. Well, my name is Ana Maria Inaz. I'm 16 years old. I was born here in Barranquilla, Colombia. I have lived all my life here. And I am from, uh, I study um, British International School. Well, personally, I think that the first thing it's um, essential for a, a government is um, education. I personally think that education must be the center of all strategies and goals for governments to, in order to visualize what the future of the city or state is going to be. For example, if, if a government really invests on making schools and be sure that all the technology that they're managing on all the resources are uh, supposed to, uh, to allow the student to have a really good development on the critical thinking and be prepared for all of the pro uh, all of the things that are, are going to uh, see in the future as, for example, um, getting a job and studying. After hearing from some of the international students, let's ask for the opinions of some experts. We'll start with Ms. Rachel Law. My name is Rachel uh, and I work for uh, U.S. domestic company in China uh, for many years, and uh, uh, I am responsible for legal affairs and other areas as well. And so I got uh, the first degree in China and then the second degree from the United States. And so uh, kind of, uh, you know, with uh, cross-cultural experience. So what do you think are the three most essential elements of an ideal government? Uh, that's a very big question and not easy to answer, I would say. And uh, different people may have different perspectives. Uh, to me, I thought the most important for the government is that, you know, they keep their people in mind and then have a nice goal to uh, help the people live better life. I think that's most important. And then how to implement this goal. And then they have, they, they got to have the second element, uh, which is to have a nice implementation plan. Uh, then the implementation plan, of course, acquire a legal structure or the, the governmental structure, I would say. And then the third important thing is to be sustainable. Uh, then they, they got to have a succession plan for this, uh, the current policy, the current uh, things that they're doing. And now we have the interview responses from Dr. James Muldoon, who is a lecturer at the University of Exeter. Let's see what he thinks are the three most essential elements of an ideal government. First of all, equal rights of political participation of all citizens. All citizens should be able to participate regularly in government through a process of sortition rather than election everyone would undertake a 24-month rotation in a governance institution. Secondly, a universal system of justice. 
rule of law applies equally to all citizens. And lastly, universal basic income. All citizens should be guaranteed a regular monthly payment sufficient to satisfy their basic needs and to not have to worry about poverty and destitution. I believe these three elements in the political, legal, and economic spheres are among the necessary aspects needed for an ideal government. Of course, there are many more, but I thought these were particularly important," says Dr. James Muldoon. Now let's hear from Dr. Ethan Putterman, who is an Associate Professor of Political Science at the National University of Singapore. My name is Ethan Putterman, and uh, I am an expert in political philosophy. My specialty is the history of political thought. And um, I've been teaching at the National University of Singapore in the Department of political science for close to like 19 years. Uh, so yeah, I teach courses on all sorts of things, um, human rights, democracy, constitutionalism. I teach a course on ancient political philosophy, you know, Plato, Aristotle, Machiavelli, all, all these sort of major thinkers of the ancient world. So yeah, I, I, I mean, I have a pretty diverse background. Uh, what do you think are the three most essential elements of an ideal government and why? As you can imagine, a question like that is quite uh, hotly contested. But um, I, I, I mean, if I had to identify, you know, three attributes of the best government, um, I would say something along the line of, uh, and, and not necessarily in this order, but possibly um, support for human rights. Uh, and then uh, secondly, I suppose, economic prosperity. And then lastly, uh, law and order. Um, now, as you can imagine, those three things don't always go well together, right? I, I mean, there, there's a, a famous you know, tension between liberty and security, right? So something like, like law and order and human rights. But my reasoning is something along the line, I, I mean, it's, it's kind of an old idea, but uh, one is that um, human rights are something which are inalienable. The most basic idea, and this runs throughout all of the major thinkers, throughout history, all the major Western thinkers at least, is that self-preservation is the one thing that everybody wants. Everybody wants to live. Nobody wants to die, right? Just like a plant will turn toward the sun, human beings will naturally, you know, seek food, shelter, air, right? So there's an idea that this is something so innate that it must be a right. So that is the basis of the right to life, is this natural predisposition towards self-preservation. So, you know, that that's the core of these. And, and then you can ask yourself, okay, well, if self-preservation is important, what conditions must accompany that for that to be realized? So there's one view that one of the major goals of the state is is to uh, not not only to to make the wealthy wealthier or the powerful more powerful, but you can judge a state uh, by how well or how poorly they they take care of those who are weakest within it. Right, Th those who are the worst off, the most impoverished. Most constitutions have what's called a preamble, and a preamble is a sort of mission statement which is very unusual. It's not the kind of thing, I mean, you do actually see this in some companies, uh, a kind of mission statement like what Apple or Microsoft, you know, how they want to help the world and so on, but it's very vague, it's very general. But it, it certainly makes the state a moral entity. So things like, you know, helping those who are worst off uh, are something, are things which, which matter. As for economic prosperity, uh, I think of, you know, there, there, there's this, uh, you know, famous line by, by Mao that people who are hungry don't care much about voting. And I think that's certainly true. Voting is important and all the sorts of civil l liberties which accompany it, which make voting a meaningful act, right? This is something which I teach my students is that voting doesn't mean much unless it accompanies things like freedom of association, freedom of expression, freedom of the press, and so on, because that, that's what makes voting a meaningful act.
right? If you, if you don't have the opportunity to posit alternatives to the status quo, you don't have the opportunity to debate with your friends and people who you don't agree with about this issue or that issue. And it's kind of a meaningless thing when it comes time to vote, you know, you, you're not what's called an informed voter. Prosperity is very important, right? So people who are hungry are not only easy to manipulate, but, uh, you know, it, it's a, something which, you know, so each state should have a kind of at least a sort of safety net to protect them. And then lastly, I suppose, uh, law and order, right? This is something which governments and politicians are concerned about all the time, not only for their own well-being, but, you know, for the good of the, com of the community. Security is a big, big deal. People are willing to sacrifice it, as you saw in the United States after September 11th. All sorts of freedoms if they really feel that their security is jeopardized. Now that we've heard from people from all over the world and from different levels of expertise on the topic, we can start to see some patterns and make some interesting conclusions. First of all, many of the aspects of an ideal government are connected and are interdependent in many ways as seen when discussing democracy and equality, and transparency and responsibility. However, some of them are also contradictory. For example, secularism and religion, and liberty and security. Secondly, the aspects mentioned are all very distinctly connected to the interviewee's background. Some people may be inclined to think a certain way because of a particular societal movement, whether it be a protest for human rights or a riot in their hometown. Every state and society operates on a very different set of rules and cultural values. Therefore, a perfect answer can't be obtained. A government must make the most appropriate and suitable decisions for its population. While democracy was one of the most responded elements, it may not necessarily work well for all governments. And while corruption does break the trust between the state and the nation, it's questionable whether or not it's ever possible to prevent. Greed is a very powerful desire after all. Lastly, education is essential to a country's development, but it's extremely difficult to be universalized without wealth and an economically prosperous state. Many of these ideals are certainly hard to achieve, and it's quite safe to say that no government today is ideal, but by having an idea of what an ideal government would look like provides a sort of guidance to leaders, states, and countries. It provides the philosophy that is necessary for a government to run on. In simplest terms, an ideal doesn't exist. But by having one in our minds, we can bring ourselves closer to it. So, what does your version of an ideal government look like?